Greetings and salutations, friends. So, with the official announcement out there, and the dwarves being one of the races I haven't covered yet, we'll move straight on onto the dwarves, or the Davi, as they call themselves. Physically, the dwarves are a stout and uh, short, well, dwarves, duh. They reach up to roughly the midriff of your average human, Sirkaish. And although relatively small, they are extremely bulky. A dwarf, although considerably shorter, is considerably stronger than a man, for example. And they are extremely tough. And have a rather unique racial resistance to magic, which allows them to shrug off many types of magical effects. And this psychological toughness also allows them to ignore wounds to a much greater degree than your average human. It does also, however, mean that they have essentially no abilities to use magic, so a dwarf simply can't be a mage. He wouldn't want to either, mind you, but he simply doesn't have the abilities to be one, even if by some ridiculous coincidence he'd want to. As for the difference between men and female, the dwarves are just ever so slightly chauvinistic, let's just say, although there is no law against women being the leaders of a clan, or going into battle, or becoming smiths, or runesmiths, or anything. They are free to do pretty much whatever they want, although they are strongly encouraged, shall we just say, by their family members to just be a good woman and do the cooking and the cleaning and all of that crap. And with that done with, moving on... To understand where the dwarves are today, it is important to understand where they once were. In the very beginning, the dwarves were practically the first creatures to inhabit the old world along with the High Elves. And in the very beginning, ancient dwarf records tells us that at one point they were little more than Stone Age man, foraging for berries and making crude weapons out of stone flint to hunt larger game. But with the advent of more advanced weaponry made of stone, flint, and bronze, came greater opportunities, with less time spent foraging or hunting the dwarves could dedicate more and more time to building and searching, until they came upon the southern edges of the World Edge Mountains, the highest and longest mountain range in the Warhammer world. And in these massive peaks, the dwarves found incredible deposits of gold, silver, iron, and grumril. And this last would prove to be by far the most valuable metal they discovered, as once smelted down and worked, Gromril could be turned into three different materials, the first of which is Mithril. Which is the most common form of Gromril, it is refined Gromril, smelted down to remove most of the impurities. It is twice as durable as steel, and weighs one-fifth as much. It also accepts runes and enchantments very easily. The second and less common way is adamant. Adamant is created using a refined technique which involves many, many, many smelting secrets and various other secret methods of workmanship to purify it to an even greater extent than Mithril. The most interesting trait, and perhaps the most valuable, of adamant is the fact that it is magically inert. So therefore, a person wielding an adamant weapon, shield, or armor is virtually immune to magic. The magic simply just fizzles out a short distance in front of him and disappears. Although it also means that in the vast majority of circumstances, it is impossible for the wearer to use magic. Though, 
That is in most circumstances. Adamant cannot be enchanted like many normal weapons, but they can be enhanced by magical runes. So you can make a fiery adamant weapon, but it has to be done by placing a rune of fire in the weapon during the forging process. And once the weapon is complete, it can never be changed. You may never change the runes in an adamant weapon, because even if you did, the new ones simply wouldn't work. The last version of Grumril is Leithero. Leithero has, in fact, only been known to have been used once in the forging of the sword Leithendrung. A crystal sword that was uh, completely anathame to the power of chaos and could kill chaos creatures by the merest touch or even by its merest presence. It is said that only a single dwarf at any given time can know the secret to refining Lythero from Raw Grumril and that dwarf may only make a single weapon during his lifetime because it literally takes his entire lifetime of hundreds and hundreds of years to make it. Some dwarven lawmasters have even speculated that Lythero is not so much a metal at all as the uh, powers of law and order and goodness and all of those fluffy things made manifest. And that is the reason why it is so damn good at banishing chaos. Although at this point in Warhammer history, Lythero can practically be considered as a bit of a myth. There simply isn't that much evidence that it even ever existed to really make a truly grounded argument whether or not it exists, but for the purpose of this video, figured I'd just mention it and let you be your own judge. And so, in their quest for these materials, they began digging ever deeper into the mountains, carving out vast halls to call their homes, and digging ever deeper in search for more and more precious minerals. And during the course of their hunt for said minerals, they scattered themselves over pretty much the entirety of the World's Edge Mountains. And at one point, they practically held the dominion over the entirety of the mountain chain and the lands surrounding it. Some clans even headed off into the Far East in search of new mineral riches and new lands to call their own. But then, catastrophe struck. The Great Polar Warp Gates at the north end of the Warhammer world collapsed, spilling the raw power of chaos into the world on a magnitude never before seen. Wiping out, mutating, or corrupting almost all of the creatures of the old world, only the High Elves kept themselves safe with their magic, and the dwarves hidden in their deep mountain halls could ride out the storm. But of those dwarves that headed into the east, nothing more was ever heard of them again. It was around the time of the collapse of the Great Warp Gates that the Ancestor Gods first appeared in the Old World, and uh, coincidence? No, probably not. Nevertheless, this was the time in which the dwarves began their tradition of ancestor worship, worshipping the original ancestors with the three main gods being Grungni, god of mining and smiths. The first of the ancestor gods who introduced the dwarves to the art of smithing, and his wife Valaya, goddess of healing and protection, who taught the dwarves the art of healing. And is said to be one of the in and is said to be one of the original inventors of the runic craft. And the third was Grimnir, the fearless warrior god, brother to Grugni, a warrior deity so powerful that it was said that he alone was enough to push back the tides of chaos demons. 
There are also a few uh, lesser deities. Gazul, Lord of the Under-Earth and Protector of the Dwarven Dead. They're God of Death, essentially, although in this case he's not so much as a uh, guardian to the Underworld, so to say, as he is the steward of the Halls of the Ancestors, as in Dwarven religion, when a Dwarf dies, he simply just ascends to the Halls of the Ancestors. Much like the myths of the northern people with Valhalla and all of that goodness. Then there's Smednir, the lesser god of smithing and the shaper of ore, said to be the ancestor god that originally placed all of the valuable ores beneath the earth. And then Thugni, ancestor god of runesmiths, who along with Valaya invented the runic arts, the art of placing magical power within runes. And lastly, the ancestor god Murgrim, ancestor god of engineers, son of Grimnir, the ancestor god who first taught the dwarves how to build machines and how to invent new things. There are some theories about another ancestor god not worshipped by the dwarves themselves, though. He is Hashut, the father of darkness, and is worshipped only by the Chaos Dwarves. And as to how the Chaos Dwarves came to be, I'll touch upon that closer a little further into the video, and I'll also probably do a video on the Chaos Dwarves in their entirety at some later date, so look forward to that. For the moment, all you need to know is that the Dwarves worship the three primary deities of Groni, Valaya and Grimnir. And these three and their lesser ancestor gods led the dwarves into the so-called Time of the Ancestors, or the Golden Age, where the dwarves under the tutelage of the gods forged many exquisite weapons of Grumnil, Mithril, Iron, Steel, and imbued them with magical power the likes of which have never before been seen and will never again be seen in the old world. And armed and armoured in weapons, and crafted suits of near impenetrable armour that were stronger than steel and yet did not impede the movements of the bearer in the slightest, and armed and armoured in these exquisite works of craftsmanship, the dwarves with the ancestor gods at their front pushed back the tides of chaos, banishing the demons from their lands and binding them to the cold, desolate northern plains where they could only subside themselves around the ruins of the warp gates. And it was during these campaigns to rid the world of chaos that the dwarves first came into contact with the High Elves of Ulthwan. And the first High Elf they met was Kalidor Dragon Tamer, one of the greatest elves to have ever lived. And through him they learned of the great Phoenix King Enerion, one of the God Kings of Elfdom. And so the two great races united in an alliance, and together they pushed the Chaos Taint completely out of the Old World and bound them around the Chaos Gates. And after doing so, the dwarves expanded. They built even greater halls and built what was to be the greatest of all dwarven halls in the mighty fortress of Karasa Karak, and established trade treaties with the elves, the then only other civilized race in the Warhammer world. We humans were little more than cave dwelling barbarians at this time. Humoured by the dwarves and allowed to live out our existence as Stone Age men, but with practically no contact between our two species. It was also during this time that the dwarves created perhaps their greatest work of engineering, the Great Underway, the greatest tunnel network in the world. Although not as expansive as the Skaven Tunnel Network, it has to be said, come on. But in sheer size and grandeur, nothing beats the Underway. Although I'm sure the Skavens will get to that in time. And so, in this great glorious age, the Dwarves seemed invincible. They could marshal hundreds upon hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of stout, 
Dur, Dwarf Warriors, and they were armed with weapons of such potency that a single dwarf could take on hundreds of orcs and win, to the point where the Greenskins were little more than a nuisance. And there were even plans in the work to wipe them off the face of the old world once and for all. But the downfall of the dwarves was not to come from chaos or greenskin. It was to be engineered practically by a single person. By the former High Elf Prince of Ulthuan, Malekith. Malekith agents assaulted dwarven trade caravans and assassinated prominent dwarves and left behind evidence that this was the work of the High Elves. The dwarves, of course, were outraged at this behavior. The dwarves were breaking their sacred oath of alliance. And for a dwarf, there is no greater crime than being an oathbreaker. Many of the more belligerent dwarves called for outright war right away. But cooler heads prevailed, and emissaries were sent to Ulthwan to demand an explanation for these incidents. But their complaints fell on deaf ears, and in one last desperate attempt to avoid outright war, the dwarves sent one final delegation to the Phoenix King Kalador II, asking for recompense of lost trade and demanding that the responsible parties be brought to justice. But the Phoenix King, in his arrogance, explained to the dwarf emissaries that they may beg, and they may humbly request his intervention, but they may never demand it. And to reinforce his point, he did something to the dwarf emissaries that was a fate far, far worse than death for any dwarf. He cut off their great long beards, shaving their face smooth, and even killed some of the emissaries. And for a dwarf, having his beard even damaged is a massive affront to have it clipped off entirely is the worst shame that could ever befall any dwarf. And when they returned to the High King's court after having been so disgraced, the dwarven High King Gotrek Starbreaker had no choice but to declare war. And so began the dwarven war of vengeance. The first and so far only World War of the Warhammer World, which lasted for decades in back and forth conflicts, with the dwarves finally emerging victorious after High King Gotrek Starbreaker killed the Phoenix King Kalador II and took his Phoenix Crown one of the most revered artifacts of the High Elves from his cooling corpse, and it resides still within the treasure walls of Karasa Karak. The High Elves abandoned the Old World, and the few High Elves that were either left to their fate, or choose to stay, fled into the forest of Atholoran, where the Dwarves simply could not follow. At least not without embarking on yet another massive campaign that would have left the forest burned to cinders. As even then, the forest of Atholoran was an extraordinarily dangerous place for anyone to set foot. Nevertheless, the dwarves completely leveled what elven colonies remained in the old world, and celebrating their victory returned to their mountain halls. But this was not to be the final fall of the Dwarven Empire, for while the Dwarves were much depleted, they were a victorious force and they were by no means broken. But then, due to the machinations of the Sorcerer King Nagash, and his final casting of an apocalyptic spell of undeath that rocked the very world itself, the World Edge Mountain's many dormant volcanoes came to life, and even the dwarves could not fight against a volcano. 
and so many dwarven holds were completely destroyed or otherwise lost during what the dwarves refer to as the Time of Woes. And as a Skaven fanboy, I can't let this opportunity pass by without mentioning that the ones who killed Nagash and stopped that apocalyptic spell from destroying the rest of the world were in fact the lovable, fluffy, furry, wonderful creatures that are the Skaven. And as if the war with the elves was not enough, and as if the natural disasters was not enough, the previous nuisances of Greenskins and Skaven came back with a vengeance. Smelling weakness, the two races swarmed over what remained of the Dwarven Empires, claiming many of the until then considered near impregnable Dwarven holds now cracked open by volcanic activity, and with vast stretches of the mighty underway destroyed by the same volcanic activity, there was simply no easy way for the dwarves to reinforce the holds so threatened, and marching across the surface even covered in dwarven armor was an extremely risky venture. A venture that the dwarves with their sorely depleted numbers simply could not risk. But the orcs, with their near limitless numbers, had no such issue, and the Skaven simply burrowed underground. And while Dwarven Tunnels takes years to complete as they are wonders of exquisite craftsmanship, Skaven Tunnels need only last long enough to bring the Skavens to their target. And if a few thousand slaves are to perish in their construction, then oh well, so be it. But the Dwarven Empire was not yet completely finished. And the Dwarves Savior, although never ever let a Dwarf hear you say that they ever needed a Savior, came from a most unexpected direction. The Barbaric Humans, living on the Great Plains that was today to become the Empire, were none too bothered by the volcanic activity, and the Orcs and the Skavens had bigger fish to fry and so they had been able to develop quite the society on their own. And it was in this time that the future god of the Empire, Sigmar Helmhammer, rescued a king of the dwarves, Kurgan Ironbeard, that had been taken captive by an orc and goblin warband. As a show of gratitude, Kurgan gifted Sigmar with the magical rune enchanted hammer Gal Maras Skull Splitter that was later to become the sigil of the Empire. Having won the respect of the dwarves, the barbaric men of the old world led by Sigma forged an alliance with the dwarves of the World Edge Mountains, and together, the humans providing the numbers and the dwarves providing the heavy shock infantry. They drove the orcs and goblins and the skaven out of many dwarven holds, and reclaimed many dwarven holds previously considered lost. And although many holds remained lost, and the contact with some of the dwarven expeditions that had been sent off into the world, including that of a particular bunch of dwarves that left for the east again, that would later come to become the Chaos Dwarves, were lost. It seemed to the Dwarves that they had regained much of their previous power, and therefore dubbed this age the Age of Silver. And it is more or less in this state that we find the Dwarves today. Their alliance with the humans of the Empire still stand, and Dwarf and men have fought shoulder to shoulder, or, well, in this case more like hip to shoulder, on several occasions since the Age of Silver. And though much depleted, the Dwarven Kingdoms are still a mighty force in the Warhammer world, possessing, as they always did, exquisite craftsmanship and incredible works of engineering. As for the internal workings of the Dwarf Empire, though, the Dwarven Kingdoms are named so rightly because every single hold has a Dwarven King, who in turn has pledged his allegiance to the Dwarf High King. 
that resides in the greatest and most impregnable of all dwarf holds, Karas Akarak, and the current High King is Thorgrim Grudgebearer, an extremely old and mighty dwarf, even by dwarven standards, and has reigned for hundreds of years. And as all the High Kings before him, he has sworn not to rest until every last grudge in the Great Book of Grudges is avenged. And the Great Book of Grudges is perhaps the easiest way to give you a basic understanding of what the Dwarves are and why they are as they are. The Great Book of Grudges is a massive tome filled with every single complaint made by every single dwarf since the creation of the book itself, and the book is not a single book at this point, it's libraries of books. And the grudge might be something so minor as Dwarf A supposedly having stolen Dwarf B's chicken. It might be over mining rights, it might be over some perceived insults thousands of years ago, or it might be considerably more important things, it might be a grudge against a particular orc for taking a dwarven stronghold, it might be a particular grudge against a particular orc tribe, and it might be so and it might be something so grand as a grudge against an entire race. And just the High Elves alone have volumes upon volumes of books dedicated to their crimes, perceived or otherwise, during the War of Vengeance. To the point where a Dwarf even talking to a High Elf is considered extremely diplomatic and open-minded. And Dwarves never forget a grudge. To the point where some grudges are no longer upheld by the same dwarf who made them. These grudges flow down the generations in almost inheritance. It is far from uncommon for the great 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 grandson of a dwarf to take vengeance on someone else because of a grudge. And the underlying reason for all of this is that the Dwarves hold their honor above all things. Nothing is as important to a Dwarf as his honor. And while they are perfectly capable of taking a joke Dwarf to a Dwarf, to the point where there is a long-standing Dwarven mining tradition, if uh, one clan of Dwarves discover a seam of ore, and another clan of dwarves discover the same seam of ore, they could take the matter up in the dwarven court system. They could carry out honor duels or decades upon decades of a judicial process to try and figure out who actually can claim the seam, or the dwarves may engage in a timeless tradition, a long-standing competition where the two dwarf clans take turns insulting each other in the most heinous ways possible, although, mind you, it has to be true. They can't just invent stuff, they can't just make up insults, they have to be based in reality, because if they're just made up, well, that's cause for a grudge. But if it's based in some manner of reality, no matter how far-fetched it may be, it's okay. And if one side can level an insult of such viciousness to the other side that it shocks them and makes them unable to respond for an entire minute, then the clan who issued the insult wins, and therefore gains the right to mine the seam. However, there are some things that the dwarves simply will not stomach at all. For example, one dwarf damaging another dwarf's beard, that's a killing offense. Never mind trying to cut off parts of it or trim it. And to the point where barber is one of the most honorable professions in the dwarves society. You would only ever let the most honorable, the most upstanding and finest of all dwarf kin ever get close to your 
beard with a sharp object. To the point where most dwarves prefer to do their trimming them themselves, and having another dwarf trim your beard is a sign of extraordinary trust and friendship, or remarkable wealth, as having one of those very, very, very few actual barber dwarves trim your beard costs a small fortune. But it just might be worth it, because along with honor, the most important thing in the dwarf social structure is making sure that everybody else knows just how honorable and just how wealthy and prestigious your clan is. Now, every dwarf king represents a single clan, and under him can be dozens if not hundreds or thousands of other clans. And each of these clans, again, have hundreds, if not thousands, of years of history and traditions. And often specialize in particular tasks. One clan may be a warrior clan, another might be a clan of miners, one might be a clan of engineers. Hell, one clan might be a clan of singers, entertainers. Or the most prestigious tradition of all, that of dwarven brewers. Because if a dwarf values his beard first, then his honor, the third thing he values has got to be his beer. The dwarves are famous brewers, and produce some of the finest ale and mead in the old world. Although, mead is a new thing, it's only been around for a few hundred years, and is considered a bit of a newfangled fad. But the good old ale, and in particular Bugman's famous Triple X Stout, is considered the finest of the brewing arts. And being able to point towards an ancestor who invented a new type of ale is one of the greatest honors that a dwarf clan can show. And all of this might lead you to the question. So, if the dwarves hold their honor above almost anything, that means, of course, that virtually no dwarf would ever consider doing something dishonorable. But how about if he doesn't have a choice? How about if he gets forced into something like the ambassadors that got sent to Ulthuan and had their beards clipped? Well, in that case, your honor is lost. It doesn't matter if someone else snipped your beard. You allowed him to do it without killing him first, so bye-bye honor. However, there is a way to regain your honor, and that is to go to a temple of Grimnir and swear yourself to his service as a dwarf slayer. This pledge involves the dwarf shaving his head and letting it regrow into a great big mohawk. The bigger the mohawk, the older and therefore less successful the slayer, but in return also the greater the warrior. Additionally, the dwarf has to color his returning hair and his beard a bright orange, so that he can show other dwarves at a proper distance that he is a dishonorable individual and that he is attempting to uh, repent for his previous sins. Once a dwarf has sworn himself to this sacred task, he is considered to have died by all other dwarves. A funeral ceremony is carried out in his name, and a tomb is prepared for him. And by all living dwarves, he is considered to have died. But crucially, he is considered to have died before his great act of dishonor and as such he gets to keep his honor. However, this of course comes with a bit of a catch. You see, taking the Slayer Oath means that the Dwarf promises to go off and die gloriously in battle. But the Dwarf is not simply allowed to just stand there and get killed, because if he does, he's not going to be allowed into the halls of his ancestors, and his honor will remain shamed. As such, even though the Dwarf Slayer's primary goal is to die in battle, he has to fight as if he wished to survive. 
or, well, not necessarily as if he wished to survive, but as if he was trying his very, very best to kill his enemy. This creates a breed of dwarf warriors who are completely and utterly immune to fear, because for them, getting killed in battle is the very point that they're even here, and so they will heedlessly charge trolls, greater demons, or whatever ever it is in search for glorious death. Although the glorious death must never come at the expense of other dwarves who still have their honor intact. So let's say that a dwarf slayer spots a huge ass orc warband heading towards a dwarven stronghold. He's not allowed to simply giggle with glee like a little schoolgirl and throw himself at the orcs. He has to go back and warn the stronghold, and once he's inside the stronghold, which he knows is going to be attacked by orcs, again, he can't just simply go see her and then run out to meet the orcs. He has to make his life worth as many orcs as possible, because otherwise he's not going to get his honor back. And how is he going to do that? Well, he has to defend the stronghold, because that's where he matters the most. And as you can probably see now, essentially the dwarf has to make every effort to stay alive while wanting nothing more than to die. And this duality of purpose, this paradox, often drives the dwarf slayers completely and utterly batshit insane, to the point where even other dwarves consider them a bit sourly. But for a dwarf that needs to regain his honor, it is the only way. And uh, precisely what is a dwarf's honor? Well, a dwarf's honor is of course, you know, acting honorable, keeping his oaths and always being true to his promises and all that, but you can essentially sum up a dwarf's worth by dividing his life into three main categories. Age, wealth, and skill. A superbly skilled and all craftsman with nothing but a copper to his name is still worth more within dwarven society than a young, unskilled but ludicrously wealthy dwarf. And by the same token, an all than a ridiculously wealthy dwarf is worth more than a young and ridiculously skilled worksman. And of course, your family lineage comes into a bit of focus. The longer and more prestigious lineage your clan hails from, the greater again your honor. Now, speaking of wealth, we need to touch upon the dwarf economy. The dwarves value gold, silver, and copper, and use them for their currency, much like the humans of the Empire. In fact, it was pretty much the dwarves who taught the humans of the Empire about economy, as well as many, many other things, like how to work stone and how to create swords of steel, etc. But the metal that they value above all others is Grumril, the strongest, rarest, and most treasured of metal known, well, pretty much anywhere, really. There is an argument that Chaos Plate is stronger than Grumril, although, eh, they're about equal, one would probably say, but... Chaos Plate is not metal, it is a combination of metal, magic, and chaos power, and so the dwarves don't recognize it as a proper alloy. And so, a dwarf who is ludicrously wealthy in gold coins could be considered to be roughly the equal of a dwarf who owns an exquisite set of Gromril armor, for example. As for how the economy itself works, well, and that's a little bit hard to uh, touch upon, simply because every single hold essentially has a different system of economy. They often mint their same coinage, although in most cases all dwarf currency is based around a weight system. So a gold coin that weighs, for example, 10 grams is worth X amount. And whether that coin has been minted in Karasa Karak or Barak Var makes little difference. 
although prices usually do vary quite a lot depending on what the particular hold is rich in. Some holds are extremely rich in coal, some in iron, some in steel, gold, silver, etc. So the cost of commodities do vary greatly, and the dwarves have a thriving trade relationship between the various strongholds, and they also trade extensively with the humans of the Empire, and somewhat less extensively with Bretonia and Kislev, and even less extensively with the border princes, and then to a greater degree again with Tila and Estonia. And though a handful of dwarves have traded with the High Elves, trading with the High Elves, un unless you can show an absolutely ridiculous profit margin, in which case it's okay because you tricked the Elves, of course, you run a rather substantial risk of losing your honor because, well, just even talking to an High Elf is considered to be just a little bit on the edge of dishonest, really. And of course, trade with the Chaos Dwarves or Greenskin, etc. Well, yeah, that's not gonna happen. And in fact, selling Dwarven beer to an Elf or an Orc, because, well, they consider the two races to be more or less equal, is a death sentence offense. Like, if you even try to sell an Elf Dwarven beer, you're just gonna get killed. <laughs> Though, mind you, if a dwarf first sells his beer to a human, which is okay, and then the human sells the beer to the elf, then that's fine, because it wasn't the dwarf who sold it. But in general, the dwarven economy is based around commodities, of course, and processed uh, goods and wares. So everything from cutlery to animal skins to fine figurines, jewelry, pretty much everything you can think of that a civilized nation would actually trade in. Now, I'll mention a few of the interesting parts about Dwarven society. The next on up is the Dwarven College of Engineers. The Dwarves have, over the years, invented and built an absolute ton of various war machines. Organ guns, flame cannons, your average good old-fashioned cannon, ballistas, catapults, and even semi-helicopters in the form of the gyrocopter. And they have even invented, built, and successfully deployed ironclad ships. And less successfully U-boats, though even today, while they have one or two that kinda works, you know, eh, they do have a rather considerable risk of, well, sinking. However, the dwarven arts of engineering is extremely conservative. A new idea? has to undergo a few hundred years of prototype testing before it will even be considered as an official design. The ironclad ship, for example, was considered to be one of the finest and thereby quickest inventions to have been ratified, as its ratification process took a mere 150 years. And this extends to all inventions, not just war machines. It extends to uh, pumps, it extends to civilian infrastructure. There has been, for example, several attempts by the dwarves to make a steam train, for example, or steam cars, and there are in fact a couple working prototypes, but again, they're a couple hundred years away from actually being built in any kind of meaningful numbers. And this complete and, uh, well, essentially utter monopoly on technology, to the point where uh, if a dwarf tries to invent something without the guild's uh, blessing, so to say, he is considered to uh, be acting dishonestly and, and therefore may lose all of his honor. And again, honor being one of the most important things to a dwarf means that pretty much no one is ever going to try. And in fact, the only one who really has is uh, the dwarf inventor Malakai Makai's son. And how did he do it, you ask? Well, he shaved his head and became a slayer. And so now he's free to invent whatever the hell he wants. 
And invented, he did. He invented a dwarven airship. A blimp, essentially. And uh, while the Dwarven Guild of Engineers has very, very, very grudgingly admitted that there might be some potential use for this invention, you know, the ability to fly through the air in a giant fucking battleship, mildly interesting, but nothing more. They do, of course, insist that it undergo a few hundred years of prototype testing just to make sure all of the bugs are ironed out. So, the point that I was originally trying to make is that the Guild of Engineers is an extremely powerful force within the Dwarven society, and has considerable political influence. And it is of course also an extremely honourable profession to be an engineer, which makes it even harder for anyone to actually invent anything new, because they are of course going to be ridiculed by the College of Engineers for being crazy mad scientists. Why can't you just make good old-fashioned cannons like everybody else, huh? Why do you have to be such a rebel dipshit? Which, while technically not illegal, has the considerable risk of uh, screwing with your family's honour, which is of course going to make the family and clan of any would-be inventor take a rather dim view to his hobby, so... Being an up-and-coming adventure in the Dwarven Kingdom's eyes, um, pretty damn hard. And then there is the equally strict Order of Runesmiths, although this one can be considered to maybe be even more crazy on the strictness, as it is just flat-out illegal to even attempt to invent a new rune unless you are an official runesmith. And even then, you'd better have been working for a couple hundred years on the rune if you have any expectations of getting taken seriously. Now, the runesmiths, as the name of course implies, are the ones who create some of the finest works of dwarven weaponry and armor, working them with powerful dwarven runes that that essentially builds magical effects into the weapon. For example, they can make a blade never lose its edge, it stays sharp at all times. Or they can bless a weapon with a fiery blade, or maybe they can make it essentially impossible to damage the blade. Or maybe they can make it exceptionally heavy without it actually impacting on the user. So while the warhead itself weighs a bloody ton, the dwarf wielding it can wield it as if it weighed nothing more than a normal weapon. And they can also of course work runes that stop enemy magic, that repel enemy weapons, and all manners of cool stuff. But they also create magical runes that can be invoked by the help of a runic anvil to cast essentially spells. For example, there is a rune of thunder that when struck upon an anvil, causes a bolt of thunder to strike into the enemy army. But of course, only the oldest and most revered of dwarf runesmiths are allowed to actually take one of the ridiculously valuable runic anvils out to battle and actually use it to fight with, because there's not that many of these anvils left, and the dwarves have kinda run out of ways to actually produce them. Like, making even one of these anvils takes dozens upon dozens of years and requires ridiculous amounts of material and for it to be smithed within practically a volcano. To give you a bit of an example about the kind of the time it takes to make uh, just a runic weapon, for example. After they formed the alliance with Sigmar, the dwarves promised 12 magical swords to be gifted to the Empire, one for each of the then tribal leaders of the Empire. Now, the dwarves very, very, very rarely make magical swords, so that added a little bit to the work time. But they were also created by the legendary dwarf runesmith Alaric the Mad. And so they were of ridiculous high quality and exquisite craftsmanships. The swords were called the Rune Fangs. And by the way, I think I should probably clarify one line of detail. 
Alaric was known as the Mad, not because he was particularly crazy by normal standards, but because the dwarves considered him crazy because he chose to stay with the humans, rather than return with the rest of the dwarves to the World Edge Mountains, so make of that what you will. But back to the point, the Runefangs took about 200 years to actually finish. So while he did essentially hand them out one by one, he did use about 200 years to make all 12 of them. So, yeah, it, it takes a while to make a, uh, a runic weapon. Anyways, as for the last little part of uh, what is going to be a rather long lore video, I'll touch quickly upon the dwarven language known as Khazalid. It is a runic language that they keep secret from pretty much everyone else. It is considered a bit of a sin to actually teach Khazalid to anyone else other than a fellow dwarf. And while here, with the power of the internet, we practically have a full alphabet of the language available, in the Warhammer world it is considered an extremely mysterious language, and only really the dwarves and a handful of human scholars know of it. And a couple of elves who manage to sneak the knowledge, but uh, the dwarves don't like to talk about that fact. And so the uh, language primarily used by the dwarves in their dealing with other races is usually the language of the Empire, Reichspiel. And it is a rather complex language, shall we just say. Every word, like for example, rock or tunnel or metal can have tons of different interpretations and tons of different words, and they also have a very odd way of structuring their sentences. They do it almost in a Japanese way, in a Asian way I should probably say, where they often put the words in strange sequence, or at least strange to us westerners. For example, if a dwarf sentence revolves around something of particular um, importance, for example, let's say that one dwarf just discovered another gold vein, and he goes to tell another dwarf. In English, it would probably be something like, hey, you know what, I just discovered a gold vein over there. The dwarfs would say gold vein, the first word out of his mouth, then the greeting, hi. I have just discovered a gold vein, because in Dwarven, the most important word is often put at the front, regardless of context. Or uh, to make a simpler one, let's say that a dwarf is looking for his spectacles, for example. He'll start the sentence by saying spectacles, I can't find my spectacles. And in some cases, if a word is considered to be particularly important, he might also say it at the end of the sentence. So, spectacles, I can't find my spectacles, spectacles. And so, in many cases, if there are multiple very important words in a sentence, it can end up as a bit of a garble. But to a dwarf, the importance of the word and the importance of the word's implications are often more important than making a coherent sentence. So even if they didn't keep it a secret, many outsiders probably simply wouldn't be able to decipher it even with the help of a dwarf. And on that note, I think I've covered uh, most of the dwarves when it comes to lore. As always, if there are any questions, please do leave a comment and I will get right back to you. I have been Arch, thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you next time. Have a good day.